You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, the PR firm that specializes in music tech, music innovation. And you know what? It's narwhal season. We're in the midst of our Swimming with Narwhals music tech competition. We're recording today's episode the day after our semifinal, which took place on September 13th, where 10 startups from all over the world pitched before three investor judges. We had startups from South Korea, the Czech Republic, the UK, the United States, of course, and many more. And the audience came as far far away as India, Mexico, Brazil. People were staying up late, getting up early. Lots of Americans showed up, of course, too. Four of the startups will make it to the final competition, which takes place at the in-person Music Tectonics Conference in Santa Monica, October 24th to 26th. You know, we bring the entire macro system together at Music Tectonics, including major DSPs, social media platforms, record labels, publishers, gaming companies, and more. And we always want to make sure we bring incredible value to the music tech startups and founders who are at the heart of innovation. So we engage with some of the most active investors in music tech during our semifinal, in person at the conference, and of course here on the podcast, like the great interview we did a couple of weeks ago with VC Juliet Rolneck of BDMI. That was on August 30th, if you haven't checked that out. For today's episode, we have two VCs from Sony Ventures. Joining us is their director at Sony Ventures, Adit Parikh, who's one of the judges in our semifinal. Welcome to the show, Adit. Hey, hey, Dimitri. How's it going? Great to have you again. It was great to see you yesterday on the, uh, the semifinal. And also joining us is the U.S. Managing Director of Sony Ventures, Joseph Tu, who you may have met at last year's conference. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hi, Dimitri. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm pumped to have you you both here. Um, And I'm excited that the two of you will be speaking or judging at our final competition at the in-person conference as well. So let's let's dive in. We want to give our our listeners good bang for the buck here. Um, Tell us about Sony Ventures. What is it and what is the investment thesis? Yeah, um, so uh, Sony Ventures is the venture investment arm, as you might imagine, for Sony Group Corporation. Um, we are actually uh, managing four funds um, known as Sony Innovation Fund. Uh, and what, when we invest, we're actually investing independent of our business units. So as, as an example, in the case of Sony Music, you know, we are looking at things independently of Sony Music, but still checking with them on investment theses uh, and what they're seeing in the market. But really, uh, Sony Ventures is focused on exploring areas that Sony may or may not be even focused on. So, you know, our, our large businesses, which might be billion dollar businesses, you know, have certain strategies that they're going into. And we're out here looking at things that we maybe we should be looking at, but haven't really come into the forefront yet. So for that, these, this family, the Sony Innovation Fund, these four funds, which generally categorize as an early stage set of funds, our early stage investing and then mid to late stage investing focuses on emerging tech in areas such as entertainment, health tech, fintech, uh, and deep tech. Um, we're about seven years old these now, and um, we have about 160 companies uh, under our umbrella in our portfolio um, and have a uh, presence in Japan, US, uh, Western Europe, Israel, and India. Nice. Um, so that's just a little bit on Sony and Sony Ventures, and with particularly with this podcast, um, Adit and I we both focus on uh, an entertainment thesis. So entertainment, as you might imagine, at Sony is uh, is a very important category, seeing that uh, you know we're a very, very unique company in this category uh, globally across the world, and um, you know our investment thesis in there is in short. The, uh, what we deem to be the future of entertainment. So it's a belief that content, the, the content creation, content distribution, content consumption, um, and all the respective funnels are changing today. And um, you know uh, the way that that content is brought to market and the way that people are using it, especially in a COVID uh, post COVID world, um, is, is something that's front and center, I think, in everybody's life. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation in the space these days, 
on how, on how people do this. And so we are out there looking at various uh, technologies out there, everything from um, Gen AI, which is obviously a, a center of conversation these days, but also like UGC platforms, the creator economy platforms uh, and the such. So, you know, we think that there's a lot of things going on that are disruptive. There's a lot of things that are democratizing content uh, along the way. And, uh, and we're, we're looking into, um, uh, a lot of different companies uh, serving those sectors from different perspectives. Got it. Very cool. Um, so I like the way you're contextualizing it for our audience too, since we do have this music tech and music innovation fo focus. And I'm sure a lot of our um, uh, listeners, especially from the startup side, are kind of like exploring the diversity and variety of the, the potential invest investment partners. I'm curious, how does Sony Ventures differ from other VCs that this music innovation field might be following? Well, I mean, when we think about VCs, there's, you know, that's a pretty broad category. So let's just talk about it two different ways. One is uh, from an institutional VC, uh, which is, you know, um, people who are, uh, whose business it is to invest in others, uh, you know, kind of corporate VCs, which is aligned more with companies and strategics that are uh, typically investing for um, a variety of different strategic reasons. For us, um, we are a strategic VC, but not in the sense that that we're there to support our core BUs um, or business units, but more in the sense that we're out there trying to explore on behalf of the company. So while we're in returns focused, you know, we're kind of a hybrid between the two um, of, of institutional and strategic VCs. You know, we are returns focused, number one, but we're also out there, you know, exploring the various avenues that we think will impact Sony, um, regardless of where our our business units are actually pointed. So, you know, the way we think about it from a corporate in, uh, perspective is that you know, we have a global footprint. So we have people in the geographies that I just mentioned, you know, Japan, Israel, Western Europe, U.S., India, um, to, to be able to have people present in local markets and to be able to serve them globally is something that's pretty difficult. And, you know, for us, what we're trying to think about is how Sony can activate with the venture, the, you know, startups and the venture community and what we can give actually to these, these startups to help them grow and evolve, to become what they should become. In the sense of institutionals, you know, we're also bringing a little bit different angle because our core competency, you know, our, our level of resource throughout the company kind of comes into play. You know, our ability to diligence, our ability to get a read on what's going on in various geographies or different technologies um, is pretty hard to duplicate. So, you know, we think that, you know, our voice is something that's a little bit different, a little bit more hybridized um, between the institutionals and the corporate VCs. Yeah, and I'll, I'll piggyback on some of what Joe said uh, in the sense that, you know, when we make an investment, we don't guarantee uh, a business or commercial deal with the Sony BUs. But what we do promise on the value ad side that Joe was hinting on is we can help expedite some of those processes and those introductions and those conversations as we have done that during our due diligence process. So when we make an investment, we typically hit the ground running and are able to add value right away. That's right. That's pretty cool. The hybrid, the hybrid aspect is very cool. It makes sense that you would kind of want to sort of use the venture fund to do some innovation searching, some innovation testing and, and so forth. But at the same time, be like, yeah, but we're not going to put the money in there unless we think there's going to be returns. So, um, and then on the back end, then to say, okay, if things are going well, we have opportunities to amplify this through our existing right. network of customers or product development, things like that. Yeah, Dimitri, we, we just fundamentally believe that our um, part in the ecosystem is to help, help companies grow. So if we focus on return, Almost by definition, they're growing. And if they stall out, I think that it's not a win for anybody, the companies, society, the industries, uh, or any of the investors. So growth uh, and an evolution of company become ultimately the, the key objective uh, any way you slice it. I also think it's worth bringing up that because of Sony's business units, having a specific portfolio of products um, it's a unique, it's a unique position for VC as well. I mean, you know, you've got, you've got ties to music, you've got ties to, um, electronic products and you've got ties to gaming as well. That's right. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a unique combination. Well, I mean, it, don't forget about, uh, the, uh, movies, TV and sports, um, there, you know, all these go. categories and entertainment, 
when we focus on the future of entertainment, we see these things blending. Um, and a lot of times, all of these categories are thinking about immersion. They're thinking about interactivity. They're thinking about reaching new, new ways to reach their core audiences. And so we see a hybridization even between all these different sectors as well. Yeah. And, and I'll also add like electronics is another big component. And then uh, Sony was built on innovation. So the R&D side is also something that, you know, we really kind of take advantage of and learn more through our R&D teams. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've been in the music industry for like 25 some years, a little more than that, actually. I hate to say it. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I remember in some early days, some music tech startups who would realize that there were applications for what they were building originally building in music, but in sports. And they might jump ship on music completely and go over to sports because the, the the TAM was so much bigger and so much more opportunity. Then more recently, we've seen a lot where there's this overlap between music and gaming, um, where you see a lot of people start in music and then they get into gaming because they realize, again, that's just such a, such, a, such a big market. So there's some fluidity that's um, available when you have that opportunity to, to, to kind of blend verticals. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, when we take that look at it from with the technology angle, the second that you bring up terms like interactive, immersive, um, even 3D assets or something, you start to get into the realm of gaming technology, which is, you know, kind of front and center these days from a technical angle. But it's also this 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 approach that, you know, musicians or, or, or the, the industry of music wants to drive into gaming, and but Gaming also wants to go the other way around, so we see a lot of um, a lot of cross section between um, each of our businesses, and in, in many ways, we're here to tie those things together from from an investment perspective um, on emerging tech in the space. Okay, we need to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to ask a little bit uh, more specifically, like what have you invested in in music tech? We'll be right back. Hello, Music Tectonics listeners. It's Shaylee here with some super exciting programming updates for the conference in October. Back for the fifth year is the Music Tech Investment Panel. Always a fan favorite as our panelists peel back the layers of what investors are looking for. Hear from Rishi Patel of Plus 8 Equity, Bruce Hamilton of Mech Ventures, and Sony Ventures' Joe Tu. Moderated by none other than Tatiana Sirisano, Senior Music Industry Analyst and Consultant at Media Research. She is an expert at what's going on in the industry and she will guide this conversation flawlessly. As always, we are staying on the pulse of what's happening in the industry, so naturally I had to program a music and gaming panel. Hear from David Knox of Reactional Music, Maria Egan of Riot Games, and Sony Ventures Investor as we dive into the explosion of music and gaming and esports. Moderated by expert Vicky Nauman, hear how music and gaming are connected more than ever before. All right, now before we get back to the episode, there's one last conversation I wanted to highlight happening at this year's event. We'll be joined by Andrea Gleason, CEO of TuneCore, for a fireside chat with Kristen Robinson, and I'm so excited to hear what these ladies have come up with. If you haven't bought your badge yet, be sure to go to musictectonics.com to purchase it now. Back to the episode. Let's flip it a little bit in, in, in terms of we've gone broad. Now let's go specific. What are some examples of investments that our music tech audience should know about? What, what, is, what is Sony Ventures doing or have actually done in terms of investment that people would be like, oh, okay, that, that, now I see. Yeah. Um, so we made a few investments and, and, you know, just something that to make clear when we make investments, it's based on our Sony Ventures team. It's not tied to any business unit like we had said earlier. So this is, you know, based on our own perspective and our own theses. Um, so we've made investments in Lander, um, uh, Tracklib, which AI enabled solutions for music creation. Uh, and then also tangentially across music in, in Kiswe, Community and Tixer. So you think about those, they kind of hit music or the music audience or, or the music uh, artists in different ways. So we try to look at the different life cycle when attending concerts, uh, being part of live events. Uh, but then I think what we've seen over the last few years, particularly during COVID, is fan engagement has become a huge part of the, the experience during the events, but also after the events and before. Um, and so we're trying to think about it in all different angles. 
Yeah, very cool. Well, that specificity I think helps because those are some names uh, we've had. We've had folks from uh, from Lander and Tracklib in in our world in, in music tectonics as well, um, and Kissway too, actually. So um, super cool to get specific there. Um, and that's stuff you've already invested in. When you're reviewing an investment pitch in music or entertainment and media, for that matter, what types of companies or specialties interest you most right now? Yeah. Uh, so you know, Joe hit on both of our like. Our overall thesis uh, when looking at opportunities, I think creator economy is something that we're really focused on. So we think of creators as the next form of small businesses. Uh, and so when we think of, think about that in that lens and that framework, it's content creation, distribution, monetization. And that's been evolving uh, over the last few years uh, with different types of products and solutions, including Web3 and Gen AI. Uh, and then I'll we hit on there again before is future of entertainment. Um, you know, the way that people are seeking entertainment and wanting more immersive, interactive experiences. Um, and so what we try to do is when we look at different companies, kind of group them or allocate them into one of these different broad areas. And then we kind of dive in and, and look deeper into how they compare to the rest of the competitive landscape. So um, it, it kind of, is more of a, broad and general focus and then kind of diving deeper into it. Uh, and I think the, both these spaces, I think, have been evolving over the last few years, uh, particularly after COVID, surprisingly. Yeah, um, that's interesting to hear you mention both the Web3 and the generative AI stuff because last year it was all Web3 all the time and this year it's all AI all the time. And, uh, you know, f f running a podcast and a PR firm and working with a lot of clients in those spaces as well, it, you know, it, I just, it just makes me wonder sometimes, like, where does the demand for these things come from? You know, it's not typically starting at the consumer level. It seems to come from the innovator level and then you also have to ask the question well how are those innovators actually getting this to market at which which means it's almost like the vcs have to co-sign on these innovations for it to actually come to market um and so it's it's kind of valuable i think just for our audience to hear <clears throat> like that vcs are interested in those spaces you know if you look at it from a consumer's perspective or do media scanning uh, and actually even before the um the web3 stuff was the metaverse stuff too right like during the there was the live streaming piece there's the clubhouse story and everyone was jumping on that then there was the 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 kind of the metaverse thing which was that vr or was it something else and it's interesting uh you know to think about sort of you you know there can be kind of a hype cycle in the media and and it's not always clear like does that align with where investors are going? Does that align with where consumers are going as well? Um, so anyway, interesting to hear on, on that topic. Yeah, I mean, Dimitri, I think it's it's, it's important um, to recognize like in entertainment specifically that we're in some pretty interesting times right now. Um, you know, COVID has been going on for quite some time. And during COVID, I would just say that I don't think I, I can recall any time in you know modern history where the entire earth, the you know, of humans have changed their behavior all at once. Right. And what that did was it accelerated some things. Um, you know, one, we found out as people like how social we really are. So even the most introverted person seeks community, maybe on a broad based level and a, mo a really extroverted person might seek community at a very individual level. But regardless, people needed to reach out. And in a COVID world where, where you couldn't do that physically, things that uh, technology became essentially very important. And so what we saw in, in massive behaviors, if you, if you look at like things like um, uh, video conferencing or, or phone conferencing, you know, those things all change. You know, the people from age three years old to 90 years old all embraced an ability to know how to talk, be comfortable on a camera, be comfortable on a phone embrace technology in order to reach out to other people. And we think that that has fundamentally changed like these funnels about how content actually gets to market. Like more people want to produce content, more people can get it out to market. More people have different ways to reach different people. And it's a web of things. So these funnels have changed and that has ultimately caused a change of behavior on how you consume um, all these things. And so all these companies are out there trying to make these things happen Venture certainly has a play in it because of the amount of capital that is deployed. Um, but the thing to focus on, I think, <clears throat> here for investors is we have a change in human behavior. So there's a social desire and a social demand to, to know how to use these tools and actually to use them 
um, and demand them as opposed to just a piece of tech that's out there waiting for somebody to use it. Um, I think it's really important to, to, to recognize what these last four years or three and a half years have represented for us. Yeah. And, and I'll add one more thing to that, uh, Demetrius. You know, on the Sony Venture side, we've been monitoring the Web3 and Gen AI space very actively, talking to numerous different companies. And, you know, some of our portfolio companies have shifted and added some Web3 capabilities or utilized Gen AI. But as a team on, in Sony Ventures, we have not actually invested, uh, at least on the entertainment gaming end, in Web3 solutions or in, in, in a company that does Gen AI. And the reason is there is a lot of uh, innovation happening. Things are changing on a daily, hourly <laughs> basis. And so some of the things that we look at are, you know, we, we are very cautious and wary of what the hype cycles look like and, and the valuations we enter. Because like we said earlier, we're, we're returns focused investors. So that's something else that we consider when looking at these different trends is we understand the value that they bring to the table uh, and what they mean for the, the industry. But we're also very wary as investors when, you know, making and putting capital into play. Yeah, great point. Scott Cohen was on the podcast a while back and he he uh, used that phrase, the uh, second mouse gets the cheese. So there's, there's, it's not always, you're not always wrong to, to kind of sit back and watch where things go <laughs> before you jump in. And, and you know, um, before we move on, like I'm, I'm really intrigued by this focus on the, the creator economy side, especially for music, because it looks like something big is happening uh, that's kind of already happened for photography. It's already happened for um, media in terms of like, you know, blogging and, and all that kind of stuff. We went from a handful of media outlets to lots of web-based media outlets. Then all of a sudden everybody was blogging and then everybody was tweeting or Xing or doing whatever it is they do now. And uh, and just just uh, yesterday on our pre-conference, Mark Mulligan from Media Research said everyone's up in arms about this 100,000 or 120,000 songs a day that are getting distributed to the DSP it's going to be millions a day is what he's saying and and to me like what you're saying about like leaning in on the creator economy that's that's what he was sort of talking about um but i'm curious if you guys have thoughts on how music will change uh, as a result of this huge growth and i know i'm just throwing that question out there but um, mm -hmm. i'm just intrigued by it you know yeah. one of the, uh, go for it um, I was going to say, like, uh, you know, there's companies like the Make It of the World and others that are out there that they're democratizing those uh, tool sets for creators. So I think what you're going to see is uh, anyone in their you know bedroom can start creating a song. It's already happening. And, and now the quality of that could increase even more. Um, and so that to me is super exciting is that, you know, folks that are fans can now be actually actively invested in it, similar to what happened with photography, uh, with like Instagram and so forth. So um, I think the tools provide access and provide a platform for individuals to start getting more involved and, in, you know, actively being being part of the process and, and doing things in, in the music creation, which is super exciting because not everyone is able to spend hours and hours, you know, learning, a, learning an instrument, but now you could audio tune your voice and now all of a sudden you could do certain things that you couldn't do before. Um, so it's, it's exciting, but at the same time, there's a lot of, you know, things that we have to also think about on the, on the regulatory and legal side as well when going into these, uh, different solutions. It's funny you bring up make, um, uh, as you know, cause you were there yesterday with the semifinal for swimming with narwhals, Stefan from make pitched and <laughs> right in the middle of his, uh, pitch, he was like, and we realized we didn't make it dumb and fun enough we had to make it dumber and funner to, and and i just thought that was so interesting like that's a shift in thinking like versus like you have to make it perfect you have to make it studio ready you know like you have to make it sound great or you have to make it so easy that anybody can do it and i think that's a shift that we're we're seeing right now adi mm -hmm. i'm curious you were there yesterday as a judge at the swimming with narwhals music tech startup semifinal competition how was your experience yeah, look, uh, last year I was part of the the finals competition, so that was super exciting. So, you know, I saw those four or five companies last year. This year was more like a broader group, and I was impressed with how how creative some of these solutions are. You know, Gen AI came through like the last eight months, and I think six or seven of the companies had used AI in their in their business model. Uh, and then, like you had mentioned earlier, they're coming from all over the world, from Europe and, and Asia and so forth. So, um, 
you know, it's it's funny to see how so many different people are attacking a problem in a different way. Uh, and, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then I was also uh, excited to hear, you know, what the other judges had to say as well. I think the insights that they provided were super helpful and exciting uh, and insightful for the founders. So um, it was a great, great pitch competition. I think it was also a very collaborative group and uh, excited to see what happens in the finals next month. Cool. I'm glad you were able to see that kind of collaborative spirit. That's the, the swimming with narwhals vibe is a little less, um, you know, uh, you know, sharky. And <laughs> so it yes. was cool to see. And, and then, you know, also with the VCs there, all of you guys had very direct questions and feedback. That was super awesome. Had you heard any of those startups before? Yeah. A couple, like I, I've talked to Stefan before, so I knew about make others. I, I wasn't as familiar with like, uh, you know, Luna Acoustic, I think that to me was really interesting, you know, with the hardware piece, uh, didn't think about it, that angle. I've seen other companies that have attacked, you know, the, the different pieces that we saw with others that were doing. Uh, so like I've seen companies going after data and ticketing and, and going after music creation and, and distribution, but something like that uh, was pretty unique. So, um, you know, you always find, learn something new every day. Yeah, that was a, that was a music education hardware piece with a with a tablet to help that's guitarists. right yeah and they and and they emphasized um that it looks good too you could leave it out in your living room and not be embarrassed about your music <laughs> equipment being everywhere because it was kind of cool looking so awesome. yeah it's aesthetically pleasing which uh, i think uh my wife would be really happy about <laughs> <laughs> all the guitarist ears perk up yeah um joe what, what have been your favorite things from from music tectonics conference in the in the past you've been you've been to some yeah you know um I think it's really clear, you know, after investing in, in a music uh, kind of music tech for some years, um, it's very apparent that the community is really tight and it's small. And, and you know, that's a great thing because if, if you bring the, the right venue and bring the right people in, um, that's what really makes a conference, right? It's like the panels are nice and the speakers are nice and everything. But it's really about the people connecting and having the chance to have the right kind of conversations. A lot of them happen in the hallways. So I've found that Music Tectonics is one of the, the best places. Like the the assembly of the right people um, gives the the Tectonics conference like a, certainly some unique uh, DNA for the sector, and people can get uh, closer and closer together, have very personal conversations. Um, and they're therefore like very productive at the same time. And, and you hear about all the, you know, when, when you, when you talk to all the people that are in music tech, you, you just come to appreciate the amount of thinking and the amount of ideas that are generating, you know, uh, in people's heads. And um, I've always just found uh, the conference to be a great place to just kind of sit, digest, share what I know in order to generate, you know, more, ideas and, and knowledge uh in the community um and just be a, you know it's, it's been great just being a part of it um so uh thanks thanks for having me at, at conferences like that are oh, you guys have been heroes for us so it's thank you both for for being being active in it as well this is awesome to hear your feedback too um because we do work hard to try to bring a real like diverse role set from music and tech and innovation and investment all together because i do think something different happens if it's just startups and investors that's one type of dynamic. If it's, you know, there's a lot of music industry conference where it's heavily emphasized on like record labels and streaming services, which, you know, a lot of the music tech innovators want to meet with them, maybe partner with them, license music or somehow use an API or something like that. But like getting all of the perspectives, I think really helps a lot. And, and you know, it's not just the startups that are feeling the support of, of meeting everybody in the ecosystem, but also, you know, the labels or the managers or the publishers or the agents or the venues also find about like where innovation is going. I mean, you guys get pitched by startups all the time, but some of these companies, you know, they don't have a they don't have a uh, top of funnel innovation mindset that's coming at them every day. Yeah, so. Dimitri, please um, for for you and everybody around you, you know, please keep going. It's not often that you come to conferences where um, it, it's more about having the relevant people in there, and relevancy is not a function of title. You know, it's not a function of what you do in the music industry, but it's a function of mindset and your penetration of whatever it is you do. So, you know, and what I was saying is, is like the interactions between 
me and a product manager versus another investor versus a, a CEO of a startup. They're all different. They're all different conversations, but it's the mixture of these things that make it really special. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's definitely fuel to keep me going in these last yeah, uh, few go. weeks before the conference. <laughs> you guys are making my day on this, but we got to take a quick break. When we come back, I'd like to ask you for some tips for some of the startup founders that are listening. We'll be right back. Hey, in case you missed it in our episode last week or in the Music Tectonics newsletter, I want to make sure you know we have announced the five finalists who will pitch in person at the Music Tectonics conference in October. These are the finalists for Music Tectonics Swimming with Narwhals. Here they are. Aux, that's A-U-X, a generative AI model that takes a text prompt and generates infinite audio samples. Get Moments, a platform that lets live event organizers collect and monetize user-generated video from concerts, festivals, and sports matches. You'll also hear from Make, spelled M-A-Y-K, voice tech with a focus on fun and easy UGC song creation tools. Offstage, a super fan platform that makes fan data accessible and actionable, and Real Count, an analytics platform for live music's key performance metric tickets sold. This startup competition final is one of the favorite events at Music Tectonics every year. Looking forward to having you there and seeing who wins. It's going to be epic. So um, let's, let's, let's go into a, a, some tips here. What, what tips do you have for first-time music innovation startup founders who are just getting started in, in seeking investment? What prep work do they need to do? Yeah, I, this is a great question. I think, you know, the answer for this is probably more market dependent uh, and it's probably not something that you want to hear, but some of the key general things that we we would advise for founders is really think through your business plan before starting to build, really understand the problem that you're trying to solve and, and think about what that market size and the market landscape looks like, just to make sure that you're not going after a space that may be already you know solved or there's already a big player in but making sure that there's an opportunity for a disruptor like yourself to be be involved in and in, in taking a place and then once you have that plan i think really identifying the team to help build that and solve for that uh so under being self-aware knowing your weaknesses and strengths and and getting folks that either support that or other folks that may be down the line that you want to hire having that kind of game plan is really important and critical uh, and then when you're trying to seek investment, investors want to know how you're going to use that money. Uh, what is the game plan of where the funds are going to be used and how you're going to build and, and, and thinking about that roadmap is going to be very critical. Um, so the prep work that I advise teams to do is understand your audience. Not each investor is the same. So really understand the nuances for them, uh, each one and doing your own homework, um, understanding what investments have they made, making sure they're the right fit for you. Um, think about like, the near-term goals as well as the long-term goals. So making sure that an investor is going to be the right partner when someone makes an investment, they're not just making a financial commitment, they're making a bet on you. And so they want them to work with you. And really that partnership is very critical. So making sure that's that's important. And then I think for us is uh, when we've talked to founders, are they open to feedback? You know, when we have a first time call, there's always constructive feedback that we provide, talking to them. And then when we have that follow-up call, we want to see how they take on that feedback. Is that something that they're addressing or thinking about? Um, or is it something that kind of just went under the rug and, and they're not considering? I think that's important because uh, at the end of the day, we, we, we think of it as a team. And like Joe had said earlier, we're, we're, we're here to help founders and management teams grow and, and you know reach their potential. And then lastly, uh, I think it's just being optimistic uh, and having that winning attitude is always critical. Uh, there's always going to be ups and downs. It's a, it's a roller coaster when you're building a, a company and starting from the ground. Um, so having being enthusiastic, believing in yourself, having that conviction is really important. But then at the same time, also being humble enough to know when to take that feedback to maneuver and, and change things. Wow, Adi, just dropping some knowledge there. Like that was like two minutes of masterclass on investment in music tech and, <laughs> and in general. So I appreciate that. Joe, how about you? Uh, I was just going to add in a couple things. Um, you know, I think it's really important. You know, when you're talking about starting to seek investment, most of the time it's because you're an early stage company. You're still trying to vet things out. So your ability to articulate, um, you know, what it is that you're going after Fairly quickly. I mean, this this goes kind of for early stage and, and uh, late stage um, companies, but 
you know, your ability to communicate and articulate your idea in such a way that somebody, you got to be able to think about whether you're a fun, what, what your idea is as a function, if it's a product, or if it's a company. Most investors want to invest in companies, right? So, you know, being able to take your core idea and take it out and help somebody see one or two steps down the road becomes really, really important. So, you, you know, in order to do that, it gets onto some of the things that Adit's talking about, you know, the way that you shape yourself, the way that you're self-aware, the way that you take things in ultimately become really key because most of the time you're going to pivot, you know, one way or another, or you're going to evolve your idea. But if you come up in front of an investor and you're raising, um, you know, dollars, if you can't articulate those things, it becomes really hard to make somebody believe that your idea is the one that stands out. And it's maybe not even your idea, but it's, it's, it's actually you as a person are the one that can carry the idea through. So I think that that's really important. In order to do that, such exploration or such um, uh, understanding of identity, you know, comes out to eventually like, what's your real punchline? What are the, what are the sound bites? Like, how do you deliver your idea so that somebody says, Hey, that's interesting. You must be the really, you know, really interesting person to, for me to put, park my money behind. Uh, that's a perfect segue into one, one of the final questions I want to ask you. Um, so, and, and by the way, Adit and Joe are both planning to be at Music Tectonics. They're still fighting over which one of them is going to be the judge at our final competition, <laughs> sorting out schedules and, <laughs> and maybe dueling a little bit for the fun, that, that, that fun role. Um, but we do have, you know, folks who are, are you know, finalists, four, four or five final. I think it's four finalists. <laughs> um, how about tips for our finalists at the Swimming with Narwhals final competition at the conference in a few weeks? You got any direct ones for them? Yeah, I think, you know, from my last year's experience, the biggest thing is, you know, prepare, making sure the tech is all ready, ready to go, uh, making sure you're able to deliver your punchline early and, and allow the, the judges and the audience to digest it and, and, and giving them, you know, the context surrounding what you're building and why you're building and solving, uh, solving for. Um, and then I think another thing is just enjoying the process. Uh, you know, this is a very collaborative group of individuals that are going to be in the room. Um, so don't put a necessary pressure on yourself, but really just use it as an opportunity to, you know, build more awareness around your startup and, and company and, and, and get yourself uh, in a better position going forward. Awesome. Great. All right. This has been excellent. I feel like there's so much information that was shared here and a lot of fuel to keep me going as well. You've mentioned that uh, what you're, you guys are keeping an eye on for the future are things in, in Web3, creator economy, generative AI. Are there any other areas that, you know, that are on the cutting edge that you guys are keeping an eye on that we should also be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll just circle back to what I was saying at the very beginning um, here. Um, there's a load of areas and we're all, we're investing very much in, in the way, like, like in the, in the, um, picks and shovels of what makes these things tick, because you have to have that underlying technology in order to make some of these companies, uh, and these ideas real, but probably most importantly, um, you know, just through experience, uh, you know, we're looking at things where innovations where we think people are going to be ready to accept and embrace those innovations, um, you know, in the near future. So the near future being, say, inside of seven years or you know, five to 10 years or something like that. But it, it has a lot to do with social acceptance. So we're not we're not looking to force technology uh, into people's lives like, hey, VCs, you know, or, or we invest in a certain areas. So we want to make this technology happen. I think it is so important to understand people and what society wants and, and the, you know, how they embrace it. And that's, that's from a creation perspective all the way through the consumption perspective. And I think it's changing to be tighter and tighter and tighter so that these areas are all shades of gray at this point. But it, it is in those areas that you'll, we think that we're going to see technology innovation. And so, Gen AI may accelerate or decelerate, you know, metaverse may accelerate or decelerate at different points in time, but they, but most, if you have the thesis of they're, they're going to be relevant, then um, you're going to, you know, start to look at these and try and get ahead of it. Um, you know, VR comes into play, web three comes into play. You know, there's a lot of technologies that bring people together, 
Um, so, you know, when we think about this and try to try to explain our thesis, we really just do think about it from what's the future of entertainment. Awesome. This has been so great. I'm so pumped to see you guys in just a few weeks in Santa Monica at the Music Tectonics Conference. It's so meaningful to me, to our company, and to our community to have you guys engaged. And I appreciate it so much. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know we do free monthly online events that you, our lovely podcast listeners, can join? Find out more at musictectonics.com. And while you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference and sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Everything we do explores the seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's my favorite platform. Connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it. We'll be back again next week, if not sooner. You're listening to Music Tectonics.